everybody, I'm Bree the Plant Lady, checking in with a garden tour from my native borders. As you can see behind me, the uh, Hydrangea Quercifolia jet stream has bloomed really well and is accelerated into its brown phase because of the heat and drought. But it's looking really great. I think that even with the brown sepals, it's a super interesting plant. And um, positioned here with my pollinator hotel and you know some of the native perennials at the base including pycnanthemum and um, that plant whose name is escaping me right now. Anyhow, let me turn this camera around and give you an update on how the native borders look as they've endured extreme heat and extreme drought. Well, pycnanthemum muticum for the win. This is definitely more heat and drought tolerant than a lot of the other native plants. And you can see the pollinator activity is off the charts. I mean, this is why you grow it. The deer don't eat it. And it's tolerating these absolutely horrible conditions that we've been enduring this summer. Of course, it spreads like wildfire, but that's okay. The fact that it's alive, the deer aren't eating it, Maybe I should just have a garden of nothing but pycnanthemum. I've actually reached that stage. I'm also pleased to see the scutellaria and cana has rebounded. This has really struggled. This is not as drought tolerant as the labels like to say. Um, and I, I genuinely thought that these were actually going to die. I didn't, I did, I've been watering them and they weren't recovering. So I'm pretty pleased to see them at this stage. Uh, I'm actually thinking maybe cutting them back um, and maybe that will produce a second flush of flowers. Um, so I'll probably go ahead and do that just as an experiment. So honestly, I don't have a lot of experience growing it, so I'm not exactly sure. But usually midsummer cutback will make it where you get to have a second flowering in the autumn. And of course the pink muley and white muley didn't skip a beat. Ornamental grasses are right there with the pycnanthemum. Heat and drought does not impact them. Well, it impacts them, but not to the point of being stressed out all the time. So <laughs> if worse comes to worse, I have to get rid of all the echinacea. That's fine, because I'll tell you what, echinacea is not the solution to the issues uh, that we've been dealing with. Echinacea does not like heat. It does not like drought. It doesn't like this kind of full sun. Um, I really thought echinacea would be more reliable than it is. And it is it is still alive. It, it's gone through some really, really rough patches. Really ugly, super wilted, just, just disastrous. Now the viburnum dentatum look great and I'm shocked that there's actually still berries on it. So usually the birds just devour these. Um, and the Carex are, they're, they're okay. They're much more yellow than I'd like them to be. But again, the heat and the drought, the full sun. Um, one plant, two plants that I'm quite pleased with are the uh, spireas, these native spireas. So this is Spirea alba. You can see it blooming here. And this is Spirea tomentosa, which has pink flowers. And last year it did bloom again. I really like the seed heads, but I am finding that this is starting to seed everywhere. Like absolutely everywhere. Cracks of the driveway, all the containers, everywhere. So probably gonna cut these off sooner than later because that is a lot of seed <laughs> to start spreading all over the properties and um well hmm yeah i didn't think about that when i planted a whole bunch of these well this rudbeckia subtomentosa is definitely a star right now and you know again the deer are leaving this alone which is awesome uh because they're eating a lot they're really eating a lot they're voracious and good pollinator activity on this as well See these sweet little bees. And I really do like the composition of this with the Spirea tomentosa. Uh, look at the Japanese beetles on the Spirea. Had a lot of Japanese beetles this year. 
more than we usually have in the Southeast. I'm from Michigan. Japanese beetles were crazy horrible. And it's one thing in North Carolina, that they're not one of our biggest pests, but this year we've had a lot more than in years past, and I don't know why. Now, this corner isn't making all my dreams come true, but again, we're not gonna do any evaluations of these beds until autumn because there's no point in trying to plant anything. We have a fair amount of open space that I don't like, and the deer are eating most of the hydrangea corsifolias out here, as you can see. So no point in having them out here. I, I might as well just put something that the deer don't eat. Um, I think the real winner of this garden is the Orangium yuccafolium, the rattlesnake master, which has these incredibly interesting thistle-like blooms. And they still needed to be watered and they were looking really rough uh, leading up to my trip where I, you know, was watering them regularly. And I ran the sprinkler over here for two hours yesterday. So this isn't just looking good because we got rain. It's also staying alive because we've been watering and watering and watering. Well, I'm pleased to see that the salvia azurea is starting to bloom and liatris, which are just seeded around. Um, that is very exciting sight. And, huh, is that caterpillar getting on these? That's different. Yep, it is. It is that caterpillar. All right, I need to treat this with BT before I lose all of my baptisias. Oh, yeah, look at them. It's a difficult world, pest versus pollinator, but not all bugs are good. <laughs> that needs to be said more often. So from a distance, this bed looks okay, but really I'm pretty disappointed in it. We've lost a lot, We've lost a lot of plants. These natives just aren't all meant for this condition. That's my fault for choosing them. But the deer are eating the echinacea, so there's not much point. See, I planted more echinacea, and the deer are eating all of it. And I am pleased to see the spireas. <laughs> the woody elements look great. It's the perennials that I'm not 100% satisfied by. We lost a good portion of this plant whose name is, I don't know, this is the Allium cernum. It's nice to see that they are blooming here. What's this? Oh, this is Prunella vulgaris. That is not drought tolerant. Probably should be like more on the edge of a woodland. <laughs> Go figure. This is not on edge of a woodland. This is a full sun former tobacco field. And it turns out a lot of North Carolina native plants do not like this completely artificial non-native environment. Um, it's, I can't say it enough. Just because it's native doesn't mean that it's adapted to the condition of your non-native subdivision. There's nothing natural about the way we build houses and the way the land is cleared. And so you can't just assume that native plants are gonna thrive because, well, they didn't come from here. They didn't, none of these plants evolved for this. <laughs> this full sun exposure in all sand. It's a huge relief to see that the red bud is looking not terrible. It was looking terrible. Um, it's like you can't water enough when it's 106 degrees outside. And one thing I'm really shocked by is actually how well cephalanthus look. And they like water, like they can grow in standing water. So it's just shocking the difference between the woody plant material and the herbaceous plant material. And I'm more of a woody's person, which is why these are shrub borders. The expectation is that these perennials will die out as the woody material gets larger and creates shade and then it'll be kind of reconfigured. Um, so I'm relieved that the trees and tree and shrub layer are doing as well as they are. Uh, but I do wish that the perennials were 
looking nicer. Um, but it is what it is. The Heliopsis is in bloom and the Monarda is starting. Now, remember, I did give everything a severe cutback uh, just to prevent flopping, also to help help keep the plants alive so that they weren't so big when they were going through such extreme uh, weather conditions. And the extreme weather conditions are not over. We have 106 in next week's forecast. We really have nothing to look forward to as far as the weather goes. July and August and often September are unrelentless in the heat. And this year we've been experiencing that earlier and more extreme than ever. So I should just be grateful that what is alive is alive because we could have actually lost a lot more plant material, especially if we hadn't been watering. Well, the pollinator pocket garden is looking pretty good. This gets more water than anywhere. So it shouldn't be a total shock that it's looking nice. Um, again, we have a lot of open space that didn't exist last year and that's, I think, from plant loss and plants not growing as rapidly and, you know, just generally kind of suffering. This, when I was talking about echinaceas looking terrible, this, this is what I'm talking about. I mean, I just want to cut these down. I, it doesn't, it makes me feel terrible to see them look that bad. Like, well, if the deer should might as well just go and eat these. So then I wouldn't have to see it. I'm really disappointed that this cute plant has pretty much expired and I don't know its name right now. I don't have a label on it. I'm sorry. I got this at Carolina Native and it was really cool. It had really neat flowers and yeah, it's just sort of fried in the middle. This Leatris is really quite pretty. Uh, I love how small it is. It's so dainty and it's got great texture. It is not enjoyed. <laughs> the extreme heat and dry, but it is alive. Uh, unlike that echinacea here, it isn't. I mean, there's some new growth coming at the bottom, but yeah, it's, it isn't. I have realized that I'm Mon Monarda punctata seeding in really random places. I lost my original plant last year. It just didn't overwinter. And I left this because I didn't know what it was. And now it's starting to bloom. It's definitely Monarda punctata, which is a cool Monarda, but it gets really big. This is absolutely not an appropriate place for it. But for now, it's going to stay because it's alive. And you can see this cup sunflower is incredible. It's tall and the pollinators love it. And I'd like to get more of this and put it in those borders because those borders lack height. And, oh, there's a yellow finch over there, which is quite charming. You see it right there on top of that viburnum. <laughs> there's no more poppy seeds for them to eat, but it's a whole lot of other stuff for them to munch on. Well, this echinacea is really the only one that looks outstanding. <laughs> it's a beautiful one. And the baldonia behind it uh, you know, we did a cut back on, but it's great. It's starting to branch out and break and we should have double the amount of flowers. So that's definitely something to look forward to. And I think a really pretty uh, entryway into the Airbnb. And in case you're wondering what's next, <laughs> we have a bunch of stuff still left over from the uh, spring open garden, including lots of one gallon ferns, Father Gilla, more Spirea, more Cephalanthus. And the plan is to do a big bed here under this Texodium. But again, we're not gonna do that right now because it's not, not the right time. We can't keep things watered in the ground very well. We don't need to add more. Of course, we are watering these pots daily, but plants stay watered better in these plastic pots than they do in the dry ground. So, uh, this will be when temperatures moderate, probably realistically not until November. Well, I'm so excited to give you a positive update on the big berm property planting. Uh, this is about two weeks old and 
it looks great. We watered this really well yesterday with the sprinkler. Aiden watered basically every day while I was gone. Then we got an inch and a half of rain last night. So I'm feeling good. We're still gonna have to irrigate probably for the rest of the summer, realistically, unless we start getting consistent rain. Uh, but today is an off day. I don't have to run sprinklers. It's cloudy. It's just like, honestly, this might be the best day of the entire summer. Um, but it's really, I'm so pleased to see everything looking happy and healthy and perky. I think when things grow out, we will have good ground plane coverage. And a lot of these plants are ones that I had out in full sun that really haven't done well. I think they're going to really appreciate this condition where they get morning sun till about noon and then they're in afternoon shade. And realistically, a lot of these natives, especially the native perennials that are easily accessed in the market, aren't aren't necessarily set for the reality of what North Carolina full sun is. And uh, that just, it can't, I can't state that enough. Now, I think you can totally see the line of where, what we planted about a month ago, maybe, maybe six weeks ago at this point versus what got planted two weeks ago. And I'm really encouraged to see how well all of this stuff is doing the polemonium and the different species of ferns and the heuchera and the uh, native verbena, um, the physocarpus. You know, the rhododendrons have been in for a year and they've been doing really well. So that's very encouraging. And yeah, I'm excited to actually get some garden projects done, but I'm not excited to do them when it's 106 degrees. But I'd really like to get some gravel and, and, and finish our gravel project, but that is a much better project to do when it's cool out. And well, it's July in North Carolina. It's not cool. <laughs> Quite the opposite. Well, everybody, I hope this tour of our Central North Carolina native gardens will serve as inspiration for you. It's mid-July. We've had a really cruel summer, um, but overall, I'm pretty pleased to see that so many of the plants are thriving, especially in the shade. And um, well, it's certainly an opportunity to reevaluate and reconsider some of the plant material that's growing out, out front in the real full sun. Um, I think I have a plant palette that isn't totally appropriate for out there. And that's just because I didn't know any better. And that's really why I like to make these videos is to share my experience with you. And maybe you can learn from my failures as I try to do because, uh, well, I find that you learn more when you do it wrong. <laughs> well, as always, I thank you so much for tuning in and I look forward to sharing more updates with you. Happy gardening and thanks for watching.